everyone. Wilkinson here. Today, my guest, and I'm really happy to have her here, is Gerilyn Lanning. And we met on the uh, production of, what, Boys of the Band last mm -hmm. year. Yes. And I was the new stage manager, and she was the brilliant costume designer who dressed everybody in fabulous clothes. <laughs> well, first of all, say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. So I'm glad you're here. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm really honored. Where do you want to start? We're going to talk about your career, but why don't we talk about where you came from and bring yourself up to the point of when you started doing the costume business. Yeah, of course. No, I came from a small town called Simi Valley, California, a really not so wonderful town, but it was great growing up there and whatnot. I don't I don't know that town. Is it seedy? It's not seedy. <laughs> it's extremely white. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So it's, yeah, that's where the Rodney King trials were. Oh. So say no more. Right. So. Anyway, so you came from there. Came from there. And of course, obviously, graduated from high school, but immediately I was going to take down a year and think about what I wanted to do. So I typically always wanted to get into the costume department, like costume world in the film industry. So I tested my luck and I went down to a very, very large costume house, which is famous to this day, called Western Costume Company, which was on Melrose, right on the Paramount lot. And everybody, every incredible glamorous movie star went and visited or did a fitting at Western Costume. It was this beautiful six-story building that was had history like no other. It was all-inclusive. You could come in there and do a film and not have to leave, literally. And it was full of brilliant, wonderful costumes from many, many, many wonderful major motion pictures dating back to, like, the 30s. So, yes, so I walked in there, and I, I ended up meeting Jim Tyson, who was the head of the department, and he liked me so much. I was 18. I had braces. I had my hair in a ponytail, and I was jumping around like crazy. In fact, I filled out my application, and I had only had one job, which was a coach, and I wrote couch slash Kelsier. <laughs> And he adored it so much that he actually hired me. Wait, so you had a ponytail? Totally. And I, I have to say, people can't see you, but your pigtails look really good today. Oh, why, thank you. Gee, thank you. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know you are. <laughs> it, they don't know. I, they don't know I'm kidding, though. But yeah, anyway, that's true. I don't have pigtails. I have to <laughs> throw in a smart aleck remark once in a while, you know. <laughs> Yes, I do. Anyway, so you and your ponytail got a job. So me and my ponytail got a job, and I started, like I said, at 18 years old at the world's largest costume house, which is where everybody wants to work. And the reason why everybody wants to work there is because your first 30 days that you work there, you get into the union. And it's a tremendously brilliant place to work because the, re the, the history and all of the knowledge that you get but when I started, I just put costumes away. I started at Halloween time, and it was open to the public, and I would just stock costumes away. You and mean you could go in and rent something? Yes. Help the public. They opened the they opened it to the public wow. on Halloween, and it was quite the show. Wow. It was pretty. It was very very busy. They don't do that today, though, right? They do. They do. They do do that today. They do. They do, which is. Quite lovely, but they don't open up the whole costume house like they did before. Like we would have Stevie Nicks come in, who'd want to be dressed as Scarlett O'Hara. Uh, you know, there was many famous people that came in to get dressed for Halloween, and very famous, successful studio people that came in to get dressed for Halloween. And it was a really wonderful way to learn, and just to learn the history of costumes going dating back until the 16th century and just learning everything from there on out. And of course, one cannot learn all of that. But yeah, at Western, I slowly, slowly graduated up into being a costumer. And then when I hit the uh, 1988 writer strike and I was laid off and I was then promised to come back, I went back and then I stayed for five more years. And then I became a senior costumer, if you will. I was the one that pulled 
all of the shows on the big movies like Dick Tracy. Well, it's been years since I saw Dick Tracy, but that was a really cool movie. I loved like the primary colors and everything in there. Was it fun doing that? It was great doing that. I mean, granted, I was just working at Western where I was able to pull all of the clothes for, not all of the clothes for the entire, for the principals, but a lot of the background and whatnot. And it was just an amazing experience there because I got to work on so many brilliant films and great plays. I got to do amazing fittings, like one with Madonna for the Vogue tour, and she was something else. She had to have a martini bar for her fitting. Really? Yes. Yes. Well, I think, but you have a martini right now, right? I do indeed. <laughs> so, gee, who's the who's... And it's 10 o'clock in the morning. I know. I'm just Yeah, kidding. come on. It's not. It's Actually, five it's, o'clock. It's, yeah, it's, it, well, it's closer to five here now. We're, when we're filming, or now we're filming, we're audioing this, so recording it. Yes. So anyway, you must have stories about uh, Hollywood. I do. I do have a couple stories. Let, let's hear a couple. Okay. Well, let's see. So... I worked at Western Costume for six years, and a wonderful man by Eddie Marks, who was the CEO of the company, recommended me to do a film with Deborah Winger and Steve Martin, which was a flop called Leap of Faith, but it was with a brilliant costume designer by the name of Theodora Van Runkel, who was very well known throughout Hollywood. She's done, her very first film was Bonnie and Clyde. She did Mame, New York, New York, Bullet, The Thomas Crown Affair, Chinatown, You Get the Gist, The Jerk, Heaven Can Wait. She was a very brilliant woman, and her and I became, like, inseparable, and she took me on. I was her assistant, and she taught me so, so much. She was such a magical, incredibly brilliant, real costume designer. They don't exist much anymore. Sorry, but they don't. She's like the real deal. Anyway, so she took me on and I worked with her for about 16 years. We did, of course, this was later on in her in her career, but it was still incredible enough to work with her. Wait, were, we, were you going to talk about Deborah Winger? Yes. <laughs> so, I'm not letting you get away on that one. Yes, so it was my very first day of shooting, my very first film. We're in Texas. I'm just scared to death, but I placed her costume on the bed. And in the costume, she wore a baseball hat and these scrunchy socks. This was back in the 90s. And you put it in her trailer. And so she comes in after hair and makeup and goes to get dressed. And all of a sudden, I get this opening up of the door. Because usually dressers, they stay right next to the trailer just in case the actress needs some help getting dressed and whatnot. She came barreling out of the trailer saying, who put a hat on my bed? And I said, I did. And she said, you have no idea that it's a complete curse. Now this film is completely, now it's going to be even worse than ever. Cause so not so if that. it was a flop, it's your fault, right? Right. And it was, yeah, of course, <laughs> totally. But I didn't realize it was a very, it's a very Jewish thing. Oh, is it? Yeah. So... After that moment, I was, she almost fired me for it, to be honest with you. And I had to straighten up my act and realize that you can't put hats on beds. I learned a valuable lesson. That's just for Jewish people, though, right? That's just for Jewish people, yeah. I don't know, but now- If I'm ever dressing a Jewish person, I will remember this. You should, yes. Please do. Wow. Yes. So I got- the third degree, and it made my job extremely nerve-wracking. But we got through the entire film. She ended up loving me, and then I went on to the next. Does she still love you after it was a flop? <laughs> I don't think so. I certainly don't. I wonder. I would seriously. I wonder if she does secretly believe that. I think, and that, and then it's your fault. She definitely, probably, still does. I'm serious because she was that mad. And also, she didn't have the chemistry with Steve Martin. I don't believe that they made it uncomfortable, if it's okay to say that. Sure. So, yes, that was my very first experience. And I'm sure there were others, though, right? Yes. What's memorable? Memorable for me is, well, Faye Dunaway 
was somebody that I dressed on my very my second film, and due to the fact that I had gotten that contact was because Theodora did Bonnie and Clyde, and she actually lived with Theodora in Lookout Mountain for two years, I think. So anyway, so I took the job and I dressed her, but she wasn't very pleased with her role at that time, I believe, because she was so she's such a beauty, and she was getting older. And as we age, she aged gracefully, but she was as great as she turned out to be in the end. But in the beginning, it was totally mommy dearest. I hate to say that. She took a hairbrush and threw it across the trailer. And one time I was I was on set and my job at that time was to make sure nothing went wrong with her continuity. Her continuity had to be spot on. So when you're doing that, you have to look at the actress while you're on set, hiding in the back behind the scenes. And she got so mad at me, she stopped the entire production and made them do the entire uh, scene over again because I was in her eyeline and got screamed at for being in her eyeline when I was just looking at her necklace, which was on her neck, to make sure it didn't move a certain way because of continuity. So yes, there was some... There were some interesting times with Faye Dunaway. I did a couple of movies with her. But always at the end, she would send me this huge bouquet of flowers and ask me to do her the next, ask me to go on the next one. Which, really? Yes, which I declined. You did? I did. I did. I ended up doing, I ended up going and, uh, let's see, after that film, I ended up going and assisting Theodora solely and just working with her. And then we did this huge Visa commercial, multi, multi-million dollar Visa commercial for the Olympics and Shirley MacLaine was in it and it was an American you know it was an American Express okay and it had different parts to it like from all around the world so it was really fun to do the costumes because there was tribal costumes it was just ethnic costumes from all over the world but then we had Shirley MacLaine who had approved Theodora's designs which were brilliant like they always are had them made and as designing, you have to sketch it, then you have to do it in muslin, and then if it fits the actress in muslin and they're happy, then you actually do it in the fabric that she chooses. Which is really pricey. Which is very pricey. Right. Well, just the whole creating it that way. Right. you got to do the different stages. Yes, yes. It's like the, a the different a stages. Of, of the final product. Right? right, Yeah. right. And you get to work with brilliant, you know, cutter fitters, which come far and few between so anyway we got there on the day it was at universal it was saturday it was early in the morning shirley was coming in she had her big trailer on the sound state i mean at universal theodore and i come in all excited and happy for the day to begin and she looks at the dress and the design and says i never approved that i'm not gonna wear that and we are shooting literally in like three hours. Right. So, and it's Saturday, mind you. Not of time to go and find an 18, it was 1860s or 1890s, a calico 1890s like day dress. So I ended up. Well, what didn't you like about it? She did not like the design, which was something that she approved and the director approved. And it's very straightforward. The period is very straightforward, but Theodora always put a little bit of her self into it. So it was a really Theodora magnified, a great design that was very unique. So, but she did not go for it. She pretended that she never saw it. Like she just seriously just said, I don't like it. It's horrible. So So you don't have people sign off on stuff? Yes, we do. We have the director signing off and we had her signing off. Because we did the fitting with her. she fit, We fit her in the final dress. There were several stages of the fitting. So her saying that she never approved it was false. But, wow. you know, you, you roll with it and you have to come up with some kind of a plan. It's Saturday. So I said, let's get security and let's get into Universal Costume House. And that's exactly what they did. Security escorted me up the elevator at the Edith Head building. And I went in the period aisle and I pulled 
maybe four or five dresses that I thought would be really good for this scene. It turned out that she loved them. Theodora loved them. Because when you're assisting a, a huge designer like Theodora, you you don't ever say, I can go find it. It's their responsibility. But you wait for them to say, okay, can you go and look for this? Which was just going to find it in a costume house. Right. And I did, and it saved the day, which was terrific. And I was very happy. Theodora was very happy. And most of all, Shirley MacLaine was very happy. So that was that one. But I've had, yeah. Did you primarily just dress women? I did, yes. Did you ever do men or not? I, or is that a whole different thing? It's a whole different thing. It, it is. It really is. I mean, women do dress men. I mean, the next movie that I did work on was with um, Johnny Depp, who was amazingly beautiful and so cool and treated everybody like, treated everybody like, um, like they were hit, like they're just human beings. So it wasn't respectful. Any... Respectful. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Yes. You could chill with him and it wasn't like you were sitting with Johnny Depp. And this was at a time that was really, really he was really, really hot at that time. So I was very, very intimidated. Wow. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. What else? You got to, how you know. many years? 32 years? You had more stories. Oh, yeah. No, I have many stories. Well, I ended up going, working with Theodora, just assisting her solely. Then, of course, I merged. I did other shows. And I was, you know, I was lucky enough to work with another big designer, Colleen Atwood. And Marlene Stewart and Anne Roth, they're Jacqueline. There's so many great, talented designers that I was very fortunate to work with. And yes, so I went on working with um, this woman by the name of Christine Peters. And she did a lot of television. And I got into television, which is such a jam. It's every eight days you're doing an episode. So I was always the key or the shopper. So I would have to literally shop all the day players, shop for the principals, have Christine approve them, and then do the fittings with all the day players. So when you say shop, do you go to, I mean, are you out shopping for new items or are you just going to the warehouse and pulling the stuff that you need? It's so is just, it depends on the period of the, of okay. the show. The um, Christine did. So it's a 1700 or 16. Not 16. 1800s Western. You're not going to go down to the store and buy stuff. You know, you are not. Unless you're going to do it like the play that I'm going to do with the punk movement, maybe. Uh-uh. Where you can be uber... No, you have to be period correct. Right. It needs to be because... But yeah, no. I went to the malls, shopped the malls, pounded the pavement for years. And I loved it, but I definitely loved doing period more. Really? Definitely, because it was more my forte. I could do contemporary because it's pretty easy. Just kind of get what's out there and what's hot. Right. But you have to get it within the characters. What did you like the most about doing the costuming? What I loved the most. And your whole career, what did you like the most? The most that I loved so much is the research and just building the film, getting the film to its aesthetically brilliant place that it needs to be. Hmm. And looking at all of the looking at when it's all done and how it's created. And it always it, it always was something that I really did enjoy, except I never watched anything that I ever did. Never? No. Why? I watched the first film because I just didn't want to look at mis- I was pinpoint and everything, so I didn't want to see my mistakes, I guess, because I can tell all of them. Mm. Yeah, but... Uh, I loved, yeah, period was my thing, going to the costume houses and pulling. Was it fun working with the celebrities or difficult for the most part? It was exciting. It was exciting, but yet nerve-wracking because they are the A actor. You do have to act a certain type of way. There's major politics in all of it, and you just have to be on your game at all times because there are many people wanting to get your job. That's how costumes is. And little do they know, it's like the hardest job in the world. Yeah. Would you say the celebrities, for the most part, are nice people or are they all full of themselves? I would, no, I think that they're, well, they're all human beings just like you and I. 
and they are they can act a little highfalutin if you will but you're used to that you know i find even the more a-list actors can be more professional than the b-list actors because they haven't quite made it if you will right so but as far as actors and i worked with all of them they've all been pretty great when did you leave hollywood i left hollywood in 2017 and why i ended up Actually, I was sick for a couple of years before that, and it took him about six years to diagnose me, but I was diagnosed with a disease called scleroderma, which affects your entire body. It's In layman's terms, it's like my body turning to stone slowly, and immediately I was put in palliative care. I was told that I was a very sick woman and that I would not be able to work again, that um, this was it. So... I went on to having terrible, terrible pain. I would get these. I still do to this day. My hands turn purple because I have secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, but that's a thing with scleroderma. And now, what does that mean in layman's terms? It means that when I'm cold, my hands turn completely blue and numb. And on top of it, a little tiny touch hurts. Like I couldn't do a zipper anymore because, or a button. I couldn't button my own because my fingers were so bad. I'd wake up crying in tears. I just, it was so painful. And then it developed. It, I was living in Ventura. It was way too cold there for me. I was on a nebulizer. I had, I started having problems breathing and it went to my lungs, which is never a good thing. So I moved, when I moved out here, I was told to kind of get my affairs in order, and it's gone to my lungs, and this was it. I would maybe last, they didn't give me a time, but usually it's, the, the most time is five years, and I just couldn't accept that. I literally, I, for anybody that has scleroderma and goes through any kind of pain, I completely understand it because I have esophageal spasms, which are really difficult to swallow. I get um, hard, it's hard for me to breathe a lot. So I have short breath all the time. There was a time there that I couldn't even get to the bathroom and back because my lungs were so bad. Mm. So there's a lot of complications with scleroderma. And if you don't take really good care of yourself, like I went and I juiced every single day for a year. I did I did celery juice every day and I started exercising and working on my breathing and taking more breaths and breathing through my nose and just taking light exercise. I went back to my pulmonologist the next year. She did an x-ray that next year. I'm sorry. Went back to my pulmonologist soon. I don't know, maybe it was like six months in and she had said to me, you have no traces on your lungs they're gone. Mm. So whatever you're doing, continue to doing it. Oh, and I also ate plant-based completely. So of course, you know, when one gets that news, you're so excited that I- You will, like you're not the diet, right? (laughs) Right. I certainly did, but I still keep up with working out because that really helps me. Are you still doing the celery juice? I am doing the celery juice, just not as often. But I do believe in juicing. I believe food is medicine, and today I'm not taking any medication for scleroderma. I'm in remission, which is great. Are you eating meat now? I am. I'm eating meat lightly, just when my body craves it. But um, yeah, no, it's been a challenge for sure. It's taken, I've been retired now. I got to have an early pension, And then I went on disability, which I kicked and screamed. I did not want to go on it. In fact, when they put me on it, I disobeyed and I went back to work to to finish the final season of the movie of the show that I was on called Masters of Sex, which was an amazing, amazing episodic on Showtime. Wow. So anyway, yeah, so I've been retired for eight years and now I'm just feeling much better. The dry heat and the the wonderful at uh, going to DHS and going to the spas has been really helpful as well. 
Oh, that's why you asked me if I went there earlier. Yes. And we were chatting. It's an amazing thing to do. It's really healing for the body. And it's very good with people that have respiratory problems. Yeah, I do recommend it. I'm too fat to go there. Oh, you are not. You are not. There's... We all think we are. We all do. I know. I do all the time. So you're retired, but you're doing the theatrical stuff. So I'm retired. In my, this, I started feeling better, and I decided, look it, I want to start styling or designing again. So um, a wonderful friend of mine, Scott, who I met on my last show, I dressed him several times. We reunited in Palm Springs, and he brought me on to Boys in the Band, which was delightful. Uh, working with Stephen was delightful. My first conversation with him, I knew he was something special and someone that really, really knew, knew how to make something special. And Boys in the Band, they worked so hard, I felt, and I was so pleased to see how it turned out because it really was. It was pretty amazing. It really was. They all had chemistry. I was sad when it ended. It was super sad. I agree. But I, you know, all the friends that I made, meeting you. Well, I went, that had to be really special. It was the most special part of it all, Wilkinson. You know that. I find you to be a brilliant, creative person. Oh, you are. Your, uh, your art and your photography is amazing. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. So where do you go from here? So where I'm going from here is, well, I did Boys in the Band, and I also got another client, which has just been recently, and his name is, um, he's wonderful, Maximo Marcuso, which is an opera singer, and I've started styling him, and... And we need to get him on my podcast, don't we? Yes. You said you that. You do. Definitely. Well, let's do it. Yeah, no, you definitely do. He's a very interesting man. He's very talented. He just did a show at the CV Rep. Had a sold out show. It was standing ovation. He's wonderful. He's a really neat person and has amazing stories to tell. And he's super positive. Love that. Me too. So I'm fortunate enough to help him, to style for him. And then Boys in the Band. And they did, they loved the clothes. So they've asked me to join them on their next season of The Bent, which, like I said, Terry, who I think is brilliant, he's a great writer. He's not only a great writer, he's a great actor. He carried that whole play. He was phenomenal. And I feel very fortunate to have met all of them. It's Stephen. And now that I've gotten to ask to do the other plays, we're going to see what happens next. So as we're wrapping up, I always ask my guests, what have you learned in your life? What are some lessons that you've learned that you like to pass on to my peeps? Oh, well, some lessons that I've learned is always, I mean, always pay attention to your inner voice because it actually is what you create. Whatever you tell yourself to yourself, the universe picks up. And whether you don't love yourself, that's exactly what will happen. So just always love yourself inside and out. And that's it. That's your main thing, huh? That's my main thing. I believe in law of attraction. And I do believe... What you do put out comes back, but it is not easy. I can say that like it's lightly, but it's not easy to practice it because our daily lives can be so frustrating and our self-talk can be so negative. But I do catch myself and I do tell myself, stop it. Do it as you're living. Live as your dream, which is what I do. And today, everything is really beautiful and great. I love it. I love the desert. I love Palm Springs. I adore all my gay friends. I love them. LBGTQ. I welcome and love them all. They have been so supportive with me, and I'm so thrilled to be a part of the bed. So thank you, all of you, so much. And I'm glad I met you and that you're in my life. Oh, me too. I like the straight ladies once in a while. Okay, good. Because <laughs> I will be straight. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. Why couldn't I just be gay? I don't know. Yeah. Luck of the draw. Totally. Anyway, you're very cool. Listen, thank you so much for having me on. Seriously. Thanks. And I love you. We'll be working together. Yes, we will. Okay. Have a great day.